replacement. Most recently, Tempest was to host the Clean House, the Style Network on the Style Network, and provided her voice for an upcoming animated feature release of Paranorman due in theaters this this year. Mr. Ronald Bell. Daryl, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Be careful what you ask for. You just might get it. Just ask Daryl Bell, who asked Spike Lee for a part in his next film that turned into a 22-year career in television and film that is still on the rise. All would, all that change will come after meeting with director Spike Lee on a weekend trip to New York. Daryl got to see She's Got to Have It at a theater where Spike happened to be signing autographs. Daryl purchased a promotional t-shirt but complained that the $10 price was too steep. He called, um, he told Spike, at that price, I want a part in your next film. Dar I'm very nervous. <laughs> it's, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm very nervous. Okay. I'm going to breathe again, y'all ready? I'm going to relax, relate, release. <laughs> in turn, Spike gave him an audition, and Daryl won the role of Big Brother in X-Ray Vision in Spike Lee's next film, School Day. Once the film was completed, Daryl headed for Los Angeles, and within three months landed the role of Ron Johnson on A Different World, a spin-off of The Cosby Show for six seasons of A Different World, was one of the highest rated shows on television and is one of the highest rated programs in the history of television. He is a regular on Politically Incorrect with Bill Mayer and has appeared on The Black Scorpion, Mr. Wright, The New Jersey Turnpike, The, the Dark Party, and has starred on Fox's House Husbands of Hollywood and recently guest starred on the TBS series, Are We Here Yet? Today's <laughs> Today's <laughs> workshop has been presented by Hampton University Center for Public Policy and Leadership and um, co-sponsored by the Department of Fine and Performing Arts. Come on, guys, so let's give a great Hamptonian <laughs> introduction to Ms. Tempest Gladstone and Mr. Ronald Bell. And our session today is moderated by none other than Reverend Deborah Hagen. Come on, let's give them a round of applause. Thank you so much. Welcome to both of you. A great big H. You're welcome to Daryl Bell and Tempest Bledsoe. This is a very interesting and a very relevant topic, and thank you for being here to talk with our students about that and hold that conversation. The first thing I'd like to ask you, um, the first time I was engaged in art and activism is when I heard Billie Holiday's Strange Fruit. And that was the first time I knew that an artist could jump right into activism and it said that art and life are synonymous. When was the first time you got the activism bug? Or when did it relate? And it's to both of you. How did you relate that to your careers? How did you get that activism bug? Um, Mike. I would say, and I first thank you all so much for having us today. Um, Please excuse my voice. I'm, I'm a little under the weather, so uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit. But I, would say, <laughs> <laughs> I would say, working on the Cosby Show, and then uh, was the strongest example of that for me. Um, because I don't think, if you think of an entertainer and a performer um, who has wed their lives with activism, I think Dr. Cosby comes to mind I agree. I agree. Uh, especially for our community. And um, I think the most powerful thing that you can show a child, you show them example. So rather than someone saying, um, you, know, you know, you should really use your celebrity to do positive things, or you should do this, you should do that. Every day when we would see that man come on set and you have on a different college sweatshirt, um, or he would have people come on the show as guest stars who were, you know, musicians and, and artists and, and um, dancers and performers of all types and teachers. Um, those are the things that leave an impression. And, you know, they always say, you know, parents will always say, do as I say, not as I do. I feel that the actions that we take are 
are the most important things that you can say about yourself. And, and they make this true statement about who you are to the world. And so growing up in that environment, um, I didn't even know that it was activism until sure. I was, you know, older and sure. in college, and now I can identify exactly what that was, and I think it was the most powerful form of it. Um, and I think it was so multi-layered, because not only did we have, um, you know, not only did we speak about certain topics on the show, um, about the war that was being fought, or about um, uh, children going to school and, and different lessons about parenting and all that, but you saw it in the clothes that we wore, the music that we listened to, the, the art. art that was on the wall. Oh. It was it was so multi-layered that message that you didn't have to hit people over the head with it. And so I think that it's just something that's really just ingrained in who I am as a performer and as a person because that was my childhood. So I'll, I'll jump in on that. Sure. Let me just say good morning, everybody. I'll say my good friend, uh, uh, Dr. Jackson and Jackson, and uh, Dr. Harvey and Dr. Danley and Dr. Ward all having you here. And, you know, the one thing that I always like about Dr. Cosby, he, he always used to say, don't talk about it, be about it. And to me, one of the criticisms that was always leveled at the Cosby show, it's not real. It's not black. It's not really as revolutionary as it really was. And the point that there wasn't some QET Newton type theme to the show discounts exactly what she's talking about. It discounts the way Chris loves play. It discounts the way they parented their children. It discounts the way they listened to black artists, the way they listen to Latino artists, the way they shape and live their lives. That was the message that which didn't necessitate you to say, I'm black every day. You know, when, when people talk about, and particularly if we're talking about activism and politics, the harshest critics of President Obama talk about, well, I can't stand his policies. I don't like this, that, the other thing. He's a good father. He doesn't talk about being a father every day. They don't talk about parenting Sasha and Malia every day. They don't talk about it. They be about it. Mm -hmm. That to me is the most powerful way you can deliver a message to somebody. Because somebody somewhere where you don't know, I always like to be to sit in a if you're sitting in Starbucks or somewhere and you're watching somebody across the street, they have no idea you're looking at. Them. They have no idea what their actions are doing that are now part of your daily life routine. So if you are setting an example at all times, there's always somebody watching you who's going to learn something good or bad about what you do. And you never know the way you will impact someone's life. I, I just went back to my <coughs> oh, yes. high school reunion. Yes. <laughs> uh, I had to say that quick, because I look so young. Uh, <laughs> but I, I went to talk to uh, uh, one of my teachers, and I told him, that I don't know if he remembers. I I, I was always I, I was a C student, and I was a C student because I was a lazy student. So I would sometimes, depending on how a semester would come, I wouldn't study for the first half of the semester. I would get straight at. Did you be telling this? Yeah. Yeah. Point. Okay. We're a comedy act. Y'all don't know this, but you'll find this out. Once I was getting straight F's, uh, uh, I then would have to get straight A's, just to average a C. <laughs> but I, and, and the problem that I had is my teachers would always say, if you have the capacity for A work all the time, why don't you do it all the time? Because I was involved in student council. I, wanted to go, I was on the soccer team. I was involved with what we had at our creative arts festival. My, my focus was always into extra activities at school. And I went to this professor and told him that, you know, because I went to a, a private school that was a jock and, and intellectual school. You either had to be a great athlete or just a literary to really be cool. And as I told him, I was struggling because if you weren't on the honor roll all the time, you know, you were looked down upon. And he told me, he said, Daryl, don't worry. 
the world is run by C students. The A students are oftentimes intellectual, but they lack often communication skills with other people. They don't know how to make friends. They can't talk to a group of people. They can't always influence and become leaders to have people follow them. C students have to find other ways that aren't just academic in order to be successful. So don't worry about your grades. You have the capacity to do whatever you want. I'm 48 years old. I never forgot. Let me ask you a question. Can I, can I address that? Let's talk about the. I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on the C student and, and 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 finding your path. It may not be academics and all of that, but for those that do balance it, let's. I just want to encourage someone who had to perform from a very young age. Um, to, to teachers as my parents and academic performance was never a question. It was expected. And so you can do all the extracurricular activities and all of that and excel at all of that and you can still deliver the grade. Let me amend my comments. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I just <laughs> place the proper focus on the moral effort, which wasn't don't try hard and succeed and do well. Oh, I thought it was. The, the point was what someone what someone's influence can be on you that you might not think is important at the time. And I'm saying for me, for my past, his coming to me not to feel the shame of the way I performed and that it did not limit my potential to be successful in life travels with me now. That was the that I, that's good. We can give him a round of applause oh. on that one. <laughs> I'll read my way out of that. <laughs> Would you say that um, there's a statement that says the revolution will be televised? Would you say that the revolution was televised in the way we see black families and some people missed it or dared not to see it? Ooh, that's a good question. That's well, really good question. well, one, let me say it's a shame to have just lost the other side of the uh, for those who didn't know him. Uh, his music really uh, talks about revolution. You, you, it's, a, it's a great question because particularly uh, with the Cosby Show and then followed by a different world, that was an era when the Cosby brand dominated America. Mm -hmm. You know, oftentimes now when you hear about television, it'll be the, the number one shows, and particularly with the fragmentation of audiences and cable, well, this is the number one show for this demographic, for this age group, for children, for men, for women. Cosby Show in a different world were the number one and two shows on all of television. Mm -hmm. So that gave birth to Fresh Prince, to Martin, to Living Single, the proliferation of people of color on television across all of the major three networks. Fox built their show, I mean their entire network. They did. Of the back of Martin mm -hmm. and in Living Color and Living Single. Once they, they got that stronghold, particularly after our shows went off the air, suddenly there was a pushback. Mm -hmm. We've had enough of that. And now, there isn't a, a, a show on any of the major networks that has anyone of color as the lead role. Once Dennis Haybert went off the air with, um, with the unit, there's, no, there's nothing left. So when you say well, that was a revolution in television, and I know it is something that Dr. Cosby looks back on and says, I showed everyone the playbook. I showed you how to get in the door, how to take control of the medium, and everyone wonders, well, where did he go? Because now it's different. Mm -hmm. um, I'll talk to you as you better say something. So <laughs> when you ask about the revolution being televised, I do think that it was. Um, I think it was very well done, though. Dr. Cosby was brilliant oh, sure. in his, in his methodology sure. because he knew what he was going to do. The people that were working with him didn't necessarily know. Mm -hmm. And I think that's for the best because if they had any 